Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Sabanal. I work for IBM's X-Force Advanced Research Team. And today I'm going to talk about possible ways to create code that hides other malware, also known as rootkits, by taking advantage of the mechanisms of Andre's new runtime called ART. So here's the agenda for my talk today. First, I'm going to give some background information. Then I will talk about, uh, I will give a high level view of ART's architecture and mechanisms, as well as the file formats that it uses. Then I will follow with the main part of this talk, which is user mode rootkits, and end with a demo. So the main motivation for this research or for this talk is that uh, there has been some recent advancements in Android security, and one of the notable ones is DIM Verity. And I won't go into detail about this, but it basically it allows Android to verify the integrity of a partition at boot time. And so you can, you can use this to detect modifications in, to, to, system, to the system partition. And it basically allows Android to protect devices from rootkits that adds or modifies binaries in the system partition, which is how um, rootkits in Android traditionally works. They add some binary or modify some binaries in the or some files in the system partition. However, this is not yet enabled by default. But uh, as security researchers want to know what can an attacker do despite of this, even if it's not yet uh, in active use. Also, we want to ask the question, can we conduct rootkit operations without touching the system partition? And to answer these questions, we turn to ART, which is uh, another new technology that's added recently to Android. This is the new Android runtime that has replaced the older one called Dalvik. Um, basically, we are going to take advantage of ART's mechanisms to modify framework and app code without touching the system partition. Okay, before we go into the details of how to do that, we I'll, I'll talk about some uh, overview of how ART works. Okay, so ART was first introduced in Android KitKat 4.4 back in October 2013. It was an, still at, at the time, it was an experimental version, and you can select which runtime you would use. But uh, uh, in November last year, it has, by, with the release of Android Lollipop 5.0, it became the default runtime. So if you're going to buy a new phone now with uh, Lollipop, that's the one that is in use. The main difference between ART and Dalvik is that it has a much, much better performance. It, uh, it does it because of the feature called ahead of time compilation. In Dalvik, uh, your application's code runs on top of a virtual machine. The, the byte code or the code for your application will be interpreted. On the other hand, in ART, your code will be compiled ahead of time. In other words, your Dalvik byte code will be converted into native code, which is the, the code that runs on the architecture of your device. So for example, if your device runs on ARM, the Dalvik bytecode will be converted into ARM code. If your device runs on x86, your bytecode will be converted into x86 code. The advantage of ART, like I said, over Dalvik is that it has better performance since your application's code will be running on bare metal, so to speak, and also because your CPU wouldn't have to do as much like interpretation and uh, other stuff, uh, it will result in better, better life. And there's also some very, very minor drawbacks, almost negligible, but it will require more storage space, space than normal because your application will be compiled into, into another file, which is stored separately, and that contains the, your generated native code. And also, every time you install an application, it will be compiled, so it will take a little bit of time. This ahead of time compilation is done at first boot or, or the first time you boot a device you bought. 
and upon system upgrade or OTA updates. Um, in this scenario, it will create a boot.out and boot image, which I'm going to talk about later. And all the installed apps on your phone will be compiled. So this will take uh, like a few minutes if you have a lot of applications installed at the time. Uh, compilation will also be done up upon app installation, like I said. And it will also be recompiled again every time you update an application. So Art does all this using a program called dex 2 which you can find in the system bin directory. Uh, this tool will compile the, back, the bytecode in classes.dex, which can be found inside your application package or in, in one of the framework jar files. It will compile this uh, classes.dex into native code. Uh, the Dexto tool uh, receives several parameters, including the location of where you have placed the file you want to compile, or the application you want to compile, and then the output location, which is normally be placed in the data Dolby cache slash target architecture, or uh, the, the folder name is the target architecture. For ARM, it's ARM, and for x86, the folder name will be x86. When your so after after the com, the ahead of time compilation is done, whenever your app is run, the code generated in the re resulting out file is executed instead of the byte code in your text file. So I won't go into the nitty gritty details of compilation, but I have I have to mention that uh, there's currently two types of compilation that can be done uh, through the to compiler backends, which is quick and portable. You can choose this by through the command line parameter compile backend for Dextool. And the current default for art is quick. So quick basically turns your Dex bytecode, or in this case, it's, the, it's called the medium level interdigit representation. It turns it into uh, low-level intermediate representation, and then turns, converts it into the native code of your device. And there are some optimizations done at each stage. Um, the portable backend, on the other hand, uses LLVM, and it converts your DEX bytecode into LLVM bitcode, then does some optimizations on it, and then use one of the LLVM, LLVM backends to generate code for your device. Now, I mentioned earlier a boot.out file. This is a sort of a master file where all the most commonly used frameworks and libraries in Android will be, will be compiled in. So it's a single out file where that contains all the code from a different uh, framework charts in the boot class path. So th these are all preloaded into the applications that you installed. So here you can see an example command line where the, the parameters for dex to out, there's a dash dash dex file, there's a lot of de dash dash dex file options, and each option will have um, a single framework jar, which can be found in the system framework folder. So these are all compiled into a single out file called boot.out. And here's a list, a much bigger list of all the, the framework jars that is included, at least in, uh, the, in a Nexus device that I've tested. So they include some, the core framework jar co uh, code APIs and some stuff for HTTP and some message, messaging APIs. Um, I mentioned, also mentioned earlier about the boot image. Uh, it's a file named system at framework at boot.art. This is also found in the Dalvik cache folder, and it contains pre-initialized classes and objects from the framework. It contains pointers to methods in boot.out, and essentially your application will refer to this image every time it calls something from the framework. So 
So as an analogy, it could, it could, you can think of it as like a import table in portable executables, wherein you can, you can, you can access the addresses of, of the methods in the framework through here, and not, not using the address in the boot.out directly. So this is loaded by Zygote along with boot.out, and here's a typical layout of it uh, once uh, it's mapped into memory. So your applications will have a similar one mapped into its memory space. Uh, it starts with the boot.art file uh, and the rest of the sections of the boot.out file will follow. Uh, here's the file format for the art image. It starts with a magic with an art string to mark it as an art file, followed by a line feed, then a version which is currently set to, I think, 12. And uh, the rest of the fields are just uh, fields that describes the link, but that, oh, they're, they are, they're also pair. So, uh, and also has the information about the base address of the image and size, et cetera. But we, this, this, the art image is um, less significant in the stock than the following, the old file format. The old file format is essentially just an ELF dynamic object, it's, which is in the ELF file format. The extensions, extension used is .out for boot.out and .dex for regular applications. You can locate in which part of the, the ELF file you can find the out related data by looking up the dynamic symbol tables with the following names, out data, out exec, and out last word. The, as you can see here, the same value field of the symbol table indicates where you can find it in the ELF file. Uh, the out data section contains headers and metadata, and also it contains the original DEX file that the the out file the out file has been compiled from. Out exec contains the compiled code, and out last word is just an end marker. So you can treat. So when you say an out file, you can just treat the start of out data until the the four bytes included in out last word as a single blob. And in uh, and afterwards, in, when I mention something about offsets, it means that it is relative to the start of out data. Alternatively, you can also uh, locate the out data and the out exec through ELF sections. Dot, the section name dot ro data, which is read only data, contain will contain the out data, and the section name dot text which contains executable code will contain both exec. So this is a basic layout of an out file. It starts with an out header followed by several out text file headers. Each out text file header represents a class that dex that has been compiled. So for normal applications there's going to be only one out dex file header. But in the case of for the, the one that I showed you earlier, the, in the case of boot.out, there can be several OTEX file headers. The OTEX file headers points, also points to the embedded DEX file inside the OT. So, your, so when you, you compile an application, the classes that DEX that contains the original bytecode will also be embedded inside the OT file. So it really helps when you're parsing because you don't have to refer to an outside file whenever you want to parse because we are also going to use some, some of the information inside the DEX files itself. So the DEX file header also contains uh, the offsets to old classes headers, which describes all the classes inside the DEX or all the classes that your application uses or the framework uses. The old class headers, on the other hand, contains the pointers to 
to the outcodes, the generated native code for each method that it tests. Okay, so here's the structure for the OAT header. It, uh, it starts with a magic value and it's set currently it's set to the OAT string followed by line feed. And uh, the version is currently 45. And it, fo it is followed by some checksums to, to verify that for integrity checking. And then there's also an instruction set field which indicates what, what the target architecture was when upon compilation. And currently there are six architecture supported ARM, <clears throat> ARM64, Thumb, to and x86, x64, MIPS, and 64-bit MIPS. Um, another relevant field here is the DEX file count, which is the number of DEX files in the out file. So for normal applications, it's one. For, for boot.out can be a lot, um, <clears throat> more than 10 or 16. And the executable offset is the offset to the executable code in the in the OAT file. It is relative to the start of the OAT header. It's uh, it's the same section pointed to by the OAT exec section that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And another relevant field for our purposes is the last one, which is the key value store. It's a dictionary containing information such as the command line use to generate this out file. So we're going to use that later on. Okay, right after the out header is an array of out dex file headers, one for each dex file that was compiled. So uh, there's an important field here that we're going to use later called dex file location data. It is the original path of the, our input dex file. So it's the path to the APK or to the jar that was compiled to generate this. And there's also the DEX file location checksum, which is the CRC32 of the classes that DEX that was compiled inside that APK. A DEX file pointer is the offset relative to the start of the OAT header into to your to the embedded DEX file inside the OAT file. Now I mentioned earlier that it's uh, nice to have nice to have an embedded, the original embedded DEX file inside the OAT. Uh, the reason for this is the following, uh, this field, the classes offsets field. Uh, it is the, the, the it is an, a list of offsets to, to the, the OAT class headers. And the length of this list is the size, uh, this is the class depth side field of the DEX file header. So you can use the embedded DEX file header to parse the classes offsets field. So each classes, class offset points to an out class header. And the, uh, there's a, an interesting field here is the type, which indicates how much, how much of the methods were compiled. Uh, you can configure your device to, or you can configure art to use different kinds of criteria on which methods will compile. You can choose whether to compile everything and you can choose only to compile all the performance intensive ones, or you can also choose to compile the only the smaller, or or the, or, or or you can only cho choose to compile only the ones that meets a criteria on the size of the methods. And you can look it up on you can look up how to set the settings in the the link shown here. So the, the type indicates how much of the method were compiled. So if type is, so it, it can have uh, three different values, zero, one, or two. So zero is out class all compiled, two, one is out class some compiled, and two is co, k out class non compiled. So if type is k out some compiled, there will be a bitmap size and bitmap field following the type field. If, uh, 
if type is one of the all compiled or non compiled, uh, this, the two, these two fields will not exist. And right after the type field will be the method offsets. The KO non compiled means that the, that none of the methods of this class were compiled and the, those methods will be interpreted instead. If type is KO class all compiled, all the methods of this particular class were compiled. Now, if type is KO sum compiled, there's going to be a bitmap with each bit in the bitmap representing a method of this class. And if that set is, if that bit is set, this mess, it means th this method was compiled. And for each compiled method, there's going to be an entry in the method offsets field. So the method offset fields points to the generate native, native code. So now we know how to locate where the generated code for that methods are. But take note that for a KSOMP architecture, if uh, the instruction set field in the auto header is equal to KSOMP2, the code set will have, code offset will have the least significant bit set. So for example, for method offset, 0143061, the actual start of the native code is at offset 143060. So now we know how to locate the methods. Uh, but there's also some other additional information if the backend that you use is the quick backend. Uh, there's a old quick method header right before the, the start of your native code. Uh, it contains a mapping between registers and IP native code and W code, and most importantly, it contains the code side, code code size of your generated native code. So, if you want to take the size of the code that you generated, that has been generated for that method, you take the four bytes prior to the start of the generated method code. So, I, I skimmed a lot of information here, but. Uh, if you're more interested in this, there's more details in the accompanying paper that you can download from the Black Hat website after this. Okay, so let's go into the core of this talk, which is the user mode rootkits. Okay, so our, our approach is basically we use Dex tool to generate alt files from modified framework or app and replace the original one. There's, we have two options. We can replace framework code and generate a new boot.art and boot.out and replace the system generated one. Or we can replace a specific application's code and generate new alt for that and replace the, that, that installed application's alt file. And Obviously, we, 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 need, we require a ritual to do all this. Okay. So the advantages of this approach is that uh, there's no low-level code required. Our code modifications are all done in Java, so there will be less problems encountered compared to doing all of this in a low-level code or doing all of this in the kernel. Another advantage is that our techniques is le uh, less affected by variations in architecture and OS version. The same approach works regardless of the ARC and iOS. And, uh, and OS. Uh, the reason for this is that we are simply using the Dex to OAuth itself or the ART itself to generate our code. So there's less uh, space for errors. Another advantage is that we don't have to deal with code signing at all. Since your apps are already installed, it's already verified. All we we have to do, we all we're doing is change the code that has been taken out and compiled outside of the application package. So we don't have to deal at all with code signing. Also, uh, in these techniques, our code runs under the context of the app running it, so it will have the same UID and app permissions automatically. For example, 
uh, if our code is running under the settings app, your code will have a system UID. And you can have, you can obtain permissions that you wouldn't normally be able to obtain if you're running as a regular app, such as the ability to reboot, the ability to write secure settings and mount unmount file systems and or to or to clear an application's user data. So how about persistence? Our code persists for as long as the old file is not replaced. Um, the, old, uh, the old file is only replaced, like I said, uh, whenever you, you, you do an OTA update or whenever that the old for that application or the, that application is updated. But our goal is not to maintain root access um, because we are avoiding, because our goal here is not to write the system or not to have anything to do with system partition at all. And the normal root kits will, will maintain root access by modifying some files in it or adding some files on it. But we do have the option to reacquire root access using a system to root exploit if you are, your code is running under system privileges. But this is left as an exercise to the reader. Now, uh, our first option is to replace framework code. Here, we replace a framework jars code with our own. Then use dex 2 to generate a new boot.art and boot.out that includes our modified jar. Uh, if you remember earlier, I showed the command line for for dex 2 when generating boot.out and there's a lot of dex slash uh, dash dash dex file parameters and you could replace one of those jars with your own with a, a version that contains your modified code then we after you have generated your own copy of boot that code you can replace the old one with it so for a purpose because you want to to create a rootkit uh, you want to hide running processes, hide files, and hide installed apps, and probably more. So uh, here's uh, some of the methods that we could target. Uh, there's, if we want to hide a running process, we could, we could replace or modify the method get running app processes, which can be found in the activity manager class. And the source code for this can be found in the AOSP under the frameworks base core folder in the Java source file activity manager. The, when compiled, this will be inside the framework.jar file, which can be found on your device in system slash framework. If you want to hide installed app, you you get you, you modify the get installed applications method in application package manager. This is, can also be found under the same folder in ASP in the application package manager Java source file. And the result is also inside framework.char. If you want to hide files from, for example, an, a file explorer application, uh, you can replace the method file names to files in the file class in in the source file found in ASP in libcore Looney in the file file.java. This, on the other hand, will be placed in the core libartchar file. So, as as an example, let's look at how to hide a running process. As I've said. We replace get running app processes whose, whose source code can be found in activity manager .java, and the build results are in framework.char. Now, here's the original source code for that method. So as you can see, it simply returns a list of running app, running app process info class. Uh, this class contains uh, information about the running app process, uh, in, including the process name for that running app application. So we need to modify the list that it returns. 
So here's a modification that we did. Uh, we simply iterate through the list before it is returned and remove the entry for for our for the application that we want to hide in this case com that possible that bad app okay after we have done the modification we have to build the modified code and not because we are going to use this modified uh, framework.jar as the source for dex 2 out but we need to get the the we, we need to get the smelly code or the, the the byte code for this we can't use this as the source for dex 2 out because it might have your your version that you compiled may have some incompatibility problems with the 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 ones in the, the other jar files installed on your device so what we're going to do is is take out the framework that jar file on your device and modify that instead so we use api tool to decode the resulting jar and locate the generated smally for the method that we modified and we're going to use the generated smiley layer to replace the original one. So you can, you can automate all this, but here's how to do it manually. And you can do this uh, on your device using ADB. Oh, but make sure it's a rooted device though. So step one is you've modified the target method. You take the smiley generated here earlier and replace the one in the, the jar file installed from you know, on your device. So you pull the original jar from the system partition, use APK tool to decode that jar and generate smiley code, then look for your target method inside the generated ones, inside the generated smiley, then replace that with the smiley code or with the method for, the, with the smiley code for the method that you generated earlier. And after you replace it, you rebuild the jar using APK tool. It doesn't matter if the, the jar that you rebuilt is not 100% the same with the one that you pulled, oh, aside from the code though. Uh, we all, the only important part of this is the classes that dex, uh, the resources are not important. So after you've done that, you have to rename the jar such that the resulting path after you have pushed it to the device is the same length with the path of the original jar in the system partition. Now, why do we have to do this? We need to, our, our, gen, our the, the old file that we generate only requires two parts that has to match with the old one. Uh, that is the, the path of the, of the source, of the source APK or jar which can be, which I mentioned earlier, the dex location path data field in the old class header, it has to match with the original one. And also the checksum for the class that dex, which is the old location file data checksum field in the old class header also has to match with the original ones match or else we will fail. Uh, dex to old will, will not compile your modifications. So, since we need to replace our the path in our generate out file with the original one, we need to make it the same length so we don't have to to relocate some offsets or move because and we don't have to move around stuff and uh, recalculate the offsets in the the subsequent fields of the headers. So we need to make it the same length so we can just patch it later on as is. Not, and then we should also get the checksum of the original classes that text, which is also we will patch to the old file later. Now, after we've done that and we've pushed the modified jar into the device, we delete the original boot.out. Then uh, we retrieve the command line used to generate the original boot.out. We can get this from the key value store field in the out header. Uh, if you remember, there is a key value store field there that's a dictionary that contains 
uh, the command line you use to generate the boot that all. Now, after we have retrieved the command line, we replace all references to our target jar with the path of our modified jar. So in this case, you see here, uh, the, the, the red ones used to be, used to point to slash system framework slash framework dot jar, like the other dex file parameters. And you have to replace all reference to that into the location of where we pushed our own modified jar file. Now, after you've done that, you run dex to all. Now, if all that was successful, uh, we need to take that boot dot out again because we have to patch the path and the checksum in the, in the dex file location data and in, in the dex file location checksum. After we have patched, we we return it. We push it again into the device in the in its original location. <clears throat> then, for the changes to take effect, we have to restart the zygote or restart the device. You can do this by using the following command, stop zygote, then start zygote. After you've done that, your installed, all your installed apps will be compiled, will be recompiled. But uh, one downside of this approach is that if you have a lot of apps installed, the user will normally notice what you've done because there's going to be a sort of message that says uh, compiling apps or something similar, or something like that. But our next option won't have that downside because uh, we, here we are replacing a specific app instead of a system framework char. It affects only a single app, so less, it's less intrusive than replacing boot.out. The downside is it only affects the apps you specifically target. So if you only target a single app to hide your malicious applications, or when the user uses another app, your changes will not take effect. <clears throat> also, apps are updated more frequently, especially uh, user apps. For system apps, not so much. On the other hand, on the previous approach, which is replacing boot.out, you only apps are updated only upon device upgrade or OTA updates. So your, your changes will, be, will persist longer. Okay, so let's look at an example of replacing app code. So in this example, we are going to replace the code in the settings APK. This is, uh, the settings APK is the, well, it's, you can find it usually on your, your Android device. It's installed as default. It shows the running processes and installed apps, among other information. And you can find the original APK in the system partition in prevap settings, settings.apk. The source code for this can be also be found in AOS, AOSP, in the package apps settings folder. So for example, if you want to hide our app from the running processes list, we look for calls to the get running app processes. Then we modify the returned running app process info list so for example, uh, you can, this is the code that's responsible for that in settings, in the settings app. Uh, so here you see it's calling the get run, running app processes and place it in, and place the list of uh, running app process info in the processes variable. And so once, you, once it has called that, we modify the processes variable and uh, we remove our application. We iterate through it, and if one of the application running app process info matches our application's name, we remove it. Now, to install, to hide our app from the installed apps list, we look for calls to get installed applications and modify also the returned application info list. And here's an example of that. The, the code responsible for this it can be found in the application state dot Java in the settings source code. So here, we also iterate to the return list of get installed applications. 
and remove the application info for the app that for the malicious app that we installed. Because to do this manually is the steps involved is almost similar to the, the ones in boot .out when we generate the boot .out with a few differences. So we pull the original APK from install location and use APK tool to decode the APK and generate smiley code. Then we use the modification modified APK here earlier and rebuild that APK. Then as we did with the boot .out, we renamed the APK such that the resulting resulting path after you have pushed it to the device the same length with the path of the original APK. Um, so we simply added some characters before the, the name, uh, the settings that APK name so that it matches the length of the original path of the settings APK. And also we get the checksum of the original class that dex. And then we prepare to run dex to out. We delete the original out file and push our modified APK to the device. And now it's time to generate our OAuth. The command line involved here is much simpler. You can also parse the old, the original OAuth file and parse its key store value field to get the, 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 the command line you use to generate it. But you can also do a simpler way here which is you assign the, our modified APK's path into the dash dash dex file parameter, and then put the, the original OAuth file's path, which is in the Delphic cache folder, into the OAuth file parameter. So that's a, here's an example of that uh, dex to OAuth command. So if that was successful, we could then pass the generated OAuth files dex path and check some like we did before. Then we restart the app. Uh, we do that by stopping the app process, or well, if it's running. Uh, we do that by using the following co command, am4 stop, then the package name of the application. So the changes will take effect at the next time the app is run. So these techniques have several limitations, which one of those is we can't hide from lower level or non-framework code. So if we, our changes are made into the framework, we can't hide it if the application that lists, run, lists running process or installed apps does not use or have an alter, alternative way of, of listing it. Also, uh, some S Linux policies may be able to solve us, but it's not a problem if you, can, if you can set enforce or you can set S Linux to permissive mode, uh, even momentarily. Because if you do that, the next time you you reboot, it will return into enforcing mode. But it, that's not that wouldn't be a problem because at that point your changes have already take effect. Also, I mentioned this as an advantage earlier, but this can also be a disadvantage. Your code is bound by the affected app's permissions, so you can't do anything that's not allowed under the context of the apps, the app that you have affected. However, since we're just, you can use this rootkit in conjunction with another malware that you wrote that has the permissions that you want to do. And you only use this rootkit to hide it. And you, that's the workaround you can do around. OK, it's uh, time for a demo. So here I have, I'm using a Jenny motion. Jenny motion image with Google Nexus 6 and Android 5.1. So this is a bad app, which contains a picture of a handsome guy. And we are going to hide this.
if you open settings uh, here, like you can see that you can see you can see that bad app is shown in the downloaded list and in the running process list you won't see it here because it's in the background. But if you show cache processes, you can see that it is running in the background. Then if you look at the, all the installed files list, you can also see that it is installed. Okay, so we're going to do this. Yeah. We have to run this tool. Um, we, are, uh, we, are, we are assuming a scenario where an uh, attacker has access to your device and plug it in to his laptop, and he's going to he has installed an uh, malicious application and now going to hide it from view. Okay, so let's do it. So here I'm pulling the settings.apk from the device. And I'm decoding it using APK tool and mo modifying all the files, the, the hiding processes thing and hiding installed applications thing. And I rebuilt it and now pushing it to the device. Okay, so now here I'm gen using dex to generate a new settings that out. Now patch it, then push it back and restart <clears throat> the application. I'm using, by the way, I'm using an emulator here so it can be easier to show as a demo, but I also have uh, an actual device, a Nexus 7 device here, so if you want to see it in action in an actual device, you can just approach me later on. Okay, so let's see if it was successful. Uh, hopefully the demo gods are in your favor. Okay, so let's open the apps. Okay, so you can see here the bad app is not shown anymore. And if you look at the run, running tab at the show cache processes, you'll see that you, you can see it's not visible anymore in this tab either. And then if you look here, you won't see it at all. So to make sure that it's running, I didn't hide it from the recent apps list. So here, you see that it is still running. But if you look at the settings apps list, it's not running at all. Okay, so that's it for the demo. Uh, Okay, now we have come to the end of the stock. To conclude, I have shown you that user mode rootkits are possible through art. And not only for offensive purposes, but you can also use these techniques for RE as well. You can use these techniques to do instrumentation on whatever you're analyzing. And we also seen that we can still achieve persistence on the device just as long as your old file is not replaced. And also I would like to mention that ARP is still very ripe for more security research. And I know of only one more research uh, that involves fuzzing the compiler in an upcoming conference. So I'm, I hope that Ah, and also, ARP is still in active development. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, they, Google released 5.1, and I had to change, change some details in this presentation and in the paper. So there are still a lot of changes being made, and some of those could be uh, security implications. And I hope that this talk uh, uh, made some of you more interested in, in doing this. Um, so, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, there's. I think there's a research where 
in, I don't remember when, but they used the binder to do that. Yeah, it, it's possible. Yeah, as long as it's not replaced, as long as not, the app's not, yeah. You can also use this for, um, for the stuff that, uh, is that exposed and uh, see the substrate, but <clears throat> those stuff are mostly used for, for changing the UI and stuff. But if, your change, the, if the changes that you want to make is on, just code only, you can use these techniques as well. Okay, any more questions? Excuse me? Oh, uh, no. Your, the application is already installed. Uh, signature checking is done upon installation. So the, the, your, it's already installed and it won't go through that at all. I'm not sure. I haven't looked into the security. Well, probably, but uh, yeah, I haven't looked into how security apps could detect this. But, but I think they they run at the lower level. I'm not sure. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, can, can I have a mic microphone? I can't. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I was just saying that uh, to execute this on the device, uh, you will need to root it, right? Yeah, you have to initially ha have, root. have it rooted. Yeah. Unless you root it, this is not going to get executed on the device. No, you have to have root at first. Yeah. But you don't ha need root to persist. Um, <clears throat> since you, you don't write to the system partition, you don't have, we, uh, at least in this talk, we have no option to persist as root. Okay. But our changes will still take effect. And if our code, for example, if I replace settings that, the settings application, our code will be running a system. And if you have a system to root exploit, which is much, much easier to achieve root than just uh, a regular user, you can re-exploit your device okay. and achieve root again, okay. but although not persistent root. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Question? Good? Oh, oh, thanks for listening. And if you have more questions and if you notice some mistakes that I made, you can contact me through the following channels. Thank you.